Hey everyone, welcome back. So I've just been playing around with the character attributes on the Sinclair Spectrum computer using this ZX Spin emulator, and I wanted to create a program to allow the user to enter uh, the values for the ink and paper color and the flash and the brightness values, and to then have the program automatically calculate the value to poke into memory and display that attribute on the screen as a color. And so I actually got a bit carried away and created a program that's a bit more involved than I was originally intending, but it came out really well. And so I just wanted to introduce it to you quickly here. So if you look over here, I have a graphic that shows you how the values for the attribute colors are actually used and calculated by the computer. And so here it shows that these three bits, D0 to D2, represent the ink value, D3 to D5 represent the paper value, and bits D6 and D7 represent the brightness and the flash values. And this byte is used by the ULA chip, which is, stands for Uncommitted Logic Array, and the ULA chip automatically transfers the contents of the memory location to the screen to display both pixels and color data, which is the attributes here. And Actually, if you're interested in learning more about the Sinclair Spectrum ULA, here is a fantastic book that I really recommend you take a look at if you're interested in this. It's called the ZX Spectrum ULA, How to Design a Microcomputer by Chris Smith. It's a really good book. It's really well written, and I highly recommend that if you are interested in a more technical description of how the Spectrum ULA works. And so I'll just take a quick look at my program I've created here. And I created this program in a structured format. So it's a modular program, meaning it has modules or subroutines. And it's actually incredibly easy to both create and troubleshoot and modify a program that's written using this modular fashion. So if we take a quick look at it here, you can see that the main program loop, which starts at line 100 here, all it does is essentially call other subroutines. So here it has all these go sub commands that call these different subroutines. The setup subroutine, the sub one subroutine, sub two, sub seven, sub four, sub five, and so forth. And if I list this program, we can see all of the subroutines are highlighted here. So the first one is the main subroutine. And then here I have sub one, and then sub two, sub three, sub four, sub five, sub six, sub seven. So this program has seven subroutines, uh, not including the main program loop and not including this setup subroutine is where I set up all the variables. And you can see this setup subroutine is also where I assign all the variables that keep track of the line numbers where all the subroutines begin. So if I keep going down here, there's also another subroutine labeled vars. And this is where the other variables get declared, the variables that don't keep track of line numbers. And we'll keep going down here. And here's another subroutine that I created called print vars. And the print var subroutine is actually interesting because the way I've set up this program is that I've used variable arrays to keep track of some of the variables, actually most of the variables. And I can actually list them if I run this print vars subroutine. So let's try that now. I'm just going to say go sub print vars because print vars is a variable that contains the line number where this subroutine starts. And I have variables assigned to keep track of the line numbers where every subroutine starts. So I could list them or run them by their variable names as well if I wanted to. So here, let's just run this print vars subroutine. And you can see I've set it up to print all of the variables that I have in this program. Well, actually not all of the variables, but just the variables that keep track of the attribute values. And you can see I've set up an array here, a numeric variable array called V, which has 10 elements, V1 to V10. And then I've also set up another array called vString, which keeps track of the names of these elements. So for example, you can see here, the name of v1 is ink, the name of v2 is paper, and then bright and flash and so forth. So all the names that are associated with the attributes characteristics are assigned in the vString array and printed here. And then these are the values here that the user is going to enter for these different colors. And also down here, we have some other values that get calculated automatically by the program. And this final column over here shows the name of the color that's associated with the value of the color. So if we go back and take a look at our program listing, the last thing I have at the bottom here is the data statement, which holds the names of the colors and some other values as well. So let's go ahead and run this program and I'll show you how it works. 
So the border color has changed to blue to indicate that it's in subroutine number one because blue is the color number one. And so I've set up the program to display the border color to match the number of the subroutine. So now I know I'm in subroutine number one because my border is a color one, which is blue. And it's asking me to enter an ink value. So let's say I'll enter an ink value of two, which should be red. Now it's asking for a paper color. So maybe I'll enter a paper color of, let's say six. And then it asks me if I want that square to be bright or not. So let's make it bright. I'll set this to one, which should make it bright. And then the flash bit I'll set to one as well. And now we see the border has changed color again and it's changed to red, which is color number two. So I know that my program is in subroutine number two now, and it's asking for the X position where I want this attribute to be printed on the screen. So let's print it in the very top right corner, which is X position 31. So I'll enter 31. And then the Y position would be zero since that's the top line, so zero. And now it's asking me for a border color. And you can see the border color of the program has now changed to white and white is color number seven. So I know that my program is now in subroutine seven. And I'll enter a border color of let's say three. And there, now I've entered all my values and the program is printing all these variables that we just took a look at. And so we can see that when it prints this attribute character on the screen, it's going to have an ink color of two, which is red. It'll have a paper color of six, which is yellow. The brightness flag is one, so it's set. That means it will be on, so the square will be bright. And the flash flag is also set to one, so it will be on as well. That means that square should be flashing. And here, since the ink color is red and the paper color is yellow, that square should flash between red and yellow since the flash bit is turned on. And it'll be at a horizontal position of 31. That's the X position, a vertical position of zero, which is the Y position. So that will be the top right-hand corner of the screen. And then here where it says address, this is the memory address where the attribute byte value will be stored in order to produce the attribute that will show on the screen. And then here we have the actual attribute value, 242, which is calculated using the formula over here. Attribute value is flash times 128 plus brightness times 64 plus paper times eight plus ink. So this is the formula we would use here to calculate the value of the attribute byte we would need in order to produce uh, the results that we want based on these individual bits within the attribute byte. And then finally, this last entry here, V10, the name of it is TBD, which stands for to be determined. So I haven't actually used this uh, particular element of this variable. So that's why it's just showing us to be determined. And I gave it a default value of triple H just because that's memorable for me to see. If I see a variable that has a value of triple H, then I'll know that it hasn't been assigned properly in the program. Oh, and here we also have the border value, which has a value of three, which should be magenta. Oh, it's already magenta. So now if I press a key, the border should stay magenta, and we should see a flashing block on the top right of the screen, which should flash between red and yellow. So I'll press a key here, and we'll see what happens. There we go. Flashing red and yellow block at the top right of the screen, just as we would expect. So that's my little program. And I've also uploaded a copy of the snapshot of this ZX Spin environment to the uh, Facebook group for my Patreon subscribers in case anyone there wants to download it and try it out in the ZX Spin emulator. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.